Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Global Perspectives in the Fight for Higher Education. My name is Allison Guess, and I'm a doctoral student here at the Graduate Center at CUNY in the program of Earth and Environmental Sciences, and I'm also a fellow with the Futures Initiative. Before I go any further, I'd like us all to acknowledge that we are blessed and that we are standing on indigenous land. And without indigenous land stolen, I might add, and the ongoing labor of people of African descent and other peoples in the United States, this institution, the Graduate Center at CUNY, would not be. And so, as we center the university as a site of colonial hauntings and revolutionary activity, we will interrogate higher education as an ontological obligation that might suggest a different way to be in the world. What are the dangers of an exclusive educational system? How does the colonial apparatus within higher education exploit and deepen existing divides? What would higher education be if it taught us how to be cooperative and generous in a human society rather than abusive, cutthroat, and competitive under global racial capitalism. In Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, he remarks, colonial schooling was education for subordination, exploitation, the creation of mental confusion, and the development of underdevelopment. And still, there is profuse need to refashion the university from what Rodney outlined 40 years ago to what we might consider a communal abolitionist asset through which perhaps a sanctuary edifice might emerge contesting the absurd notion of human illegality and the ability to be detained, abducted, and arrested on university grounds. Last year, in a Futures Initiative discussion titled Teaching as Social Justice, I was invited to be a respondent to a lively panel. In that discussion, Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore fiercely defined the university we're fighting for as one that supports what Gilmore calls an abolition geography. It is my hope that through this timely discussion, we can share strategies across the global register, highlighting the urgent need for abolition and decolonial education. In the age of Betsy DeVos, and all her settler capitalist predecessors, the need for revolutionary political ev education is ever central. I'm honored to hold space today with some of my mentors, comrades, teachers, and colleagues. Please join me in welcoming Mariana Poyares from the New School, Zandi Rabidi, and Cleopatra Ntumba from the University of South Africa, Z Dempster from the Graduate Center at CUNY, Eve Tuck from Ontario Institute for Educational Studies, and Dr. Ariana Martinez from La Guardia Community College. This roundtable discussion is the fifth in this year's University We're Fighting For series. It ties liberation pedagogical practices to race, class, gender, and institutional change. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Is this better? Yes, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank you all for having me here today. I would like to thank the Futures Initiative and especially Allison for this invitation. I'm much honored to be here today and have this conversation with you. Um, I'm here to talk about um, the occupations that are ongoing in Brazil, both in universities and in schools throughout the country, and talk about, a little bit about the history of these occupations and the current status of these occupations. Um, in November 2016, more than 100, uh, 1,100 public schools and universities were occupied by students in Brazil. The nationwide protest that was called the Student Spring consisted basically in students occupying public institutions of education as a way of protesting against both a reformulation of public high school's curricular and an austerity package announced by the new Brazilian government, which includes a 20-year social spending freeze to be locked up into the Brazilian constitution. The amendment to the Constitution eventually was approved by the National Congress. 
Its consequences to public education in Brazil are still unclear, but will certainly be dramatic. Something that needs to be clarified um, is that historically, most in institutions of higher education in Brazil are public, including universities. The oldest and most traditional universities in Brazil are either public or privately run by sectors of the Catholic Church, especially the Jesuits, who obviously have a very large presence in the country since the times of the colonization itself. Uh, but the widest network of universities, both demographically and geographically, are public universities. And when I say public, I mean entirely free. No tuition or fee of any sort is charged, independently of the student's so socioeconomic status. Um, such institutions are either run by the federal government or by the state government, the government of the state. Uh, the very existence of higher education in such models is funded upon the premise that universities should provide a social service to the public. This is the main idea behind this model of university system. All services provided by universities, meaning both teaching and research, are funded by the federal state. Private funding, especially for research in STEM, have been growing in recent years, it is true, but it's still a minority of the overall budget of public universities. However, it is important to stress how, uh, how the population has access to this completely free public universities, right? Um, the door of entrance to any higher education in Brazil, be it public or private, is through a general test a general national test. One scores defines which institutions she will able to enroll in. Due to the fact that the public universities have always been the most prestigious universities in the country, the majority of the student body was composed by students coming from the private school system, therefore, since the private school system would provide their students with training sessions focused on this general test. So therefore, historically, public universities have been the place of education of the Brazilian elite. Uh, the demography of such student body has changed in the last years with the implementation of affirmative actions in universities, which would then by law reserve quotas for self-declared black and indigenous students, as well as students coming from the public high school system. This change in the student body's demography reverberated throughout the universities as a whole. It was a welcome opening, a welcome democratic opening of public universities. So how did the occupation start? The occupations started before the, pre the present crisis ongoing in Brazil. They started by the end of 2015. In late 2015, the government of the state of Sao Paulo was caught in two scandals concerning schools. First, a corruption scandal regarding the deviation of public money that should go for school lunches. And second, uh, to say the least controversial decision of the state government of Sao Paulo of, on reorganizing school districts and expanding the number of students per class. The goal of uh, the government state was to uh, be able to close entire schools and therefore reduce their expense with public secondary schools. They would just move the, the students around to other, uh, other schools since the classes would be classes, the maximum limit of students per class is now 30 and it was expanded to 50. So as a response, students from public high schools of Sao Paulo started organizing and <coughs> occupying schools which were in danger of being closed. The occupations were initiated, organized, and run by students as a way of protecting the very existence of their schools. The students would first form an assembly and then divide into subgroups. Each subgroup would be responsible for a specific activity within the occupied school. Cooking, cleaning, security, teaching, running workshops, etc. 
The idea is that the school fully run by students should not stop. It should present itself as the beating heart of the community, a vector for the full social inclusion of the youth in society. The protagonism of the occupation was entirely in the hands of the students themselves, and these are very young students, they're 12 to 15 year olds, uh, who claimed for themselves the responsibility of saving their schools. As a way of dissuading the amplification of the occupations or the public support for the occupation, the government applied two tactics. First, a direct attack on the secondary students themselves who are part of the occupation, either by turning the public opinion against the occupations, by saying that the schools were being torn apart or vandalized by the students, or by claiming left-wing extremism, or that the students were being manipulated by political parties, or even scaring the parents, right? Um, and the sec second tactics would be to just simply send police squads who would then violently remove the students from the school grounds. The secondary school students organized realized that the best tactics that they had in order to oppose a negative image that was being portrayed of them was to make the occup occupations as public and as open as possible to a larger audience. In other words, to open the occupied schools gates to the community. The occupations quickly spread throughout Sao Paulo and by the end of 2015, more than 200 schools were occupied and running, occupied and running. Famous artists started visiting the schools. We have videos and videos that would be sent throughout like major media outlets of very famous um, artists speaking. And the occupations in Sao Paulo were somewhat successful. They did manage to halt the organization, the reorganization that the state government had. Um, however, in late 2016, the rise power of the new government uh, made two announcements. First, a reform of high school curricular, and second, the austerity package that would freeze all investments in education. These announcements made, made the occupation spread nationwide, like wildfire. And not only in schools, but also in universities. So the occupation of universities campuses is a, as a tactic of resistance has long been used in Brazil. However, there has never existed such a widespread national occupation movement. As I mentioned, at, by the end of 2016, just last year, we had more than 1,100 uh, institutions being occupied by students. The main idea behind the occupation in universities was to influence lo local congressmen and the wider public opinion against the amendment to the Constitution. Uh, the occupations in university followed the same structure that was being deployed in secondary schools, forming a self-governing assembly. You can see in this picture, this is the assembly uh, run by students in the Federal University of Sierra in the northeast of the country. Um, the students would take over the administrative aspects of the institution, cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, but, and, I'm so sorry, I'm hurry a little bit. Okay. Uh, the overall governmental response to the occupations follow a similar pattern. Violent deoccupation by the police and the negative influence of the public opinion. Uh, in order to offer a more nuanced view of the occupations to the wider public, um, they deploy the same strategy as the secondary schools. However, I must highlight how groundbreaking of an initiative it is, especially if we consider that universities, differently from local schools, are considered to be self-encapsulated elite institutions with no contact whatsoever with the larger public. Opening up to the community was then a very groundbreaking strategy for them. A working class man would never feel comfortable going into university grounds. And uh, students were running workshops, concert, theater performance to the general public. Only a few, however, but a few nonetheless, actually invited members of the local community to teach and give lectures, inverting the logic that knowledge is produced exclusively by, academic, by academics. This initiative slowly but steadily shifted the public opinions towards the occupations. 
um, so I'm just concluding. By the end of 2016, the amendment to the Constitution was approved in both houses, but the fight over the future of public education in Brazil, both in schools and universities, is far from over. Many lessons were learned, but at least one remains, that in order for free universal education to survive, institutions must open their doors to the community. They must truly become an institution that is aware of itself as a public institution in the full sense of the term, an institution that works for the public. Its social function must be a guiding principle at all times especially in the case of universities. If universities remain nothing more than a hub for, for the production of elite intellectual work, public universities will slowly die and give place to private universities who have been growing exponentially in the last decade in Brazil. Hello. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm Professor Ariana Martinez, and um, I'm going to be talking about the Sanctuary Campus movement. Um, I, I guess to introduce myself, I can say that um, my scholarship has focused on um, anti-immigrant uh, municipal ordinances um, in the United States, and so through researching anti-immigrant policy at the local level, that also led me, of course, to um, learn about the counterparts, which are sanctuary cities. Um, and then sort of uh, after that, um, I moved into studying and researching DACA and the kind of local implications of DACA for what I thought was going to be a happier story. But we sort of know how that turned out. Um, and uh, I'm an urban geographer by training, um, so it's sort of... Um, I think important to sort of put out front that I see the world through that lens of everything as a contested space, right? Including, of course, the university. Um, so there have been a lot of questions, I think, floating around about what it means to be a sanctuary campus. And I wanna try to address some of that. Um, I think um, a lot of us here are familiar with the sanctuary city um, and you know, the kind of history of the sanctuary movement in churches and as a kind of political movement that came out of the 1980s um, with the Central American refugees. So what is this sort of new reformulation around the sanctuary campus? Um, and I've been thinking about it in two ways. I don't know, has anyone here read any of the campus resolutions that are floating around? A few people, so CUNY has one. Um, most of the CUNY campuses have additional ones. There's a bunch that came out of California. Um, in a couple slides, I'll have a, um, I'll have a map that shows all the campuses that have a petition floating around. But in any case, so I think that it's, so for me, yes, the petitions, yes, the um, colleges that have brought um, resolutions to this, their college se senates, um, all of that is important, but it, it's more of about a political movement, right, than just a kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of aspirational or or um, of, or statement of purpose, right? It's a political movement. So there's sort of two ways that I'm thinking about this, and ways to approach it. I think at the university, um, and and so th these images are obviously about messaging, right? So how are we sort of thinking about this? Um, so the first one is mitigating harm, um, and this is what I call sanctuary from above. Um, and, and, those, and ultimately it's about sort of possibilities within the law or sort of possibilities within the status quo. And within this, um, some of the things that I'm thinking about and that I think schools are org organizing around are priorities that include protecting student data, um, establishing official processes uh, that greatly reduce access um, 
that, acts, that agencies like the NYPD and, ha and ICE have to students. Um, this is the kind of delay tactic, right? You send them to the legal department and the legal department tries to slow them down, right? Um, that they can't just sort of walk onto campus and remove someone. Um, an increase to legal services to students and their families, that's something a lot of campuses around the country are working on. Um, an increase um, in free mental health services, uh, we all understand why that is very important in this time of fear and uncertainty. Um, bringing diversity and sensitivity trainings to faculty and staff. I think this is really important. I know um, little things, even with the best of intentions, you know, a faculty member will send an email that says, to the, you know, to the um, foundation or the scholarship department, so and so, you know, name and, and student ID of my student is undocumented, can you help them, you know? And, and so all of this becomes potentially discoverable information from legal. Um, so all of these things sort of, I think, need to now be accounted for. Um, and then a statement from the administration promising no punishment or retaliation for faculty or students that engage in political activity around this issue. So these are some of the things, again, sanctuary from above, um, thinking about possibilities within the status quo. And then there are these more like radical interpretations um, and, and that uh, sort of, <laughs> that do not limit us to sort of contempt current legal limitations, right? So thinking about how to expand sanctuary, not just about kind of the campus as a safe space, but the campus as a kind of, again, this kind of radical interpretation of sanctuary. Um, and so the priorities here are different, right? Um, the role of civil disobedience, um, emergency and rapid response teams that may come from faculty and students, um, partnering with groups outside of campus, um, me meaning sort of locating the campus as part of the larger community. For us at LaGuardia, for people who don't know, we're located in Queens, so making connections with community-based organizations, churches, and other things um, to be, again, become part of this emergency and rapid response team. Um, uh, and then uh, to sort of move into this, um, again, it's sort of aspirational, but I think it's it's important to push the boundaries of this sort of non-cooperation non and non-compliance with any state or federal agency that deport or incarcerate students and their families. So this is a tricky one. You know, what we keep hearing from the administration is, oh, how can we do that? How can we do that, of course? Um, but that's one of the things that we need to work on, right, is kind of push the legal boundaries. Um, and then divesting from companies that participate um, in any of these sorts of uh, industries. And, and so ultimately, this is about... Um, a kind of history, you know, if we think about history as, thanks, if we think about history as a sort of series of law breakings, right, um, we're th these are all kind of creative ways to resist um, and take back the, sp the space of our university and also the safety of our students. So now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, sort of what that has looked like practically and on the ground at LaGuardia. Um, so, a big part of it is organizing across scales. So these images um, represent different things that I'll mention. Um, this sort of panel on our campus stage, um, that's members of what we call the LaGuardia Rising Committee. And that is a committee ba uh, made up of faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, so this again, this is the kind of sanctuary from above, right? Um, and so this is where we're, this was at opening sessions, we were sort of presenting back to the campus on some of our findings. But this is where we're working on things like protecting student data, figuring out how to create more space on campus to bring in more nonprofit lawyers and things like that. Um, so really kind of small and incremental, but important changes in the kind of day-to-day -day lives of our students. And then the PSC sign, for people who don't know, the PSC is our faculty union, right? Um, the PSC has now created a kind of sanctuary organizing group, um, which faculty um, from across campuses are organizing together. So thinking about things like curriculum, um, putting pressure on the chancellor and kind of CUNY Central to take on some of these issues, et cetera. Um, in the corner where it says the hate-free zone, um, that is a project that the organization DRUM, which stands for Desi Rising Up and Moving, is working on. They're kind of heading up an umbrella. They're sort of the head of this umbrella group, building coalition in uh, there's a Queens branch and also a Brooklyn branch. Um, and so kind of bringing in, bringing in the business community, bringing in different religious organizations, et cetera. Um, so they're not using the term sanctuary, but it's a, sort of around the same ideas, right? The same concepts. Um, 
obvious, oh, so the Defy, Defend, and Expand a Strategy session on Sanctuary, um, an organization called Mehente in Philadelphia uh, had a weekend long um, organizing retreat and um, we sponsored students to go from LaGuardia. So I think that that was a kind of opportunity for them to gain new skills and be part of a larger conversation. And here's this map I mentioned, which just shows you um, all the campuses around the country that are kind of organizing around this hashtag and around these concepts. Um, and so there's Facebook groups and things like that where uh, faculty and students are kind of exchanging ideas. Um, so really, down to the local level at LaGuardia, one of the things that we've done that has been really effective um, is we've had one town hall and we're about to have another one next week. And it's just an opportunity, as you can see from these pictures, to get faculty and students together talking and organizing in a kind of non-hierarchical space, right? So just a conversation. And what has come out of it is a bunch of teams working on different elements of this um, in a real kind of grassroots way. And I have to say, like, there really isn't a history of political organizing at LaGuardia. Um, so this is, like, it's just being jump-started now. Um, and, and then lastly, just to stay really student focused, um, this top photo is a bunch of students um, doing outreach in the kind of main atrium to get more students involved. Um, we had a couple of rallies, that's what the other photos are about. Um, obviously this impacts you know, undocumented students of which our campus has many. Um, the travel ban um, affects some of our student body, um, you know, Muslim and all other immigrant students in the LGBT community. So thinking about sanctuary kind of broadly, um, you know, over 60, over 60% 60 of our students, I believe, are foreign born. So almost everyone is touched in some way. And some of our main organizers that are kind of moving into leadership roles are people who are students who are American citizens, but their families are undocumented. Um, so they both are able to kind of be the face of it, um, but not be as vulnerable as some other students. So I think there's ways in which their um, students are collaborating to figure out who um, can take more risk and who can take less risk, and that's some things that we're working on. With faculty as well, because some faculty um, are green card holders, and it's also more of a risk to be doing civil disobedience. Um, so yeah, I would just say the most hopeful thing, um, just to end, has been that um, this past week, um, the student team, the student organizing group, sent an email to faculty saying that we're no longer welcome in their meetings. <laughs> um, and, and so for me, that's very inspiring because it means that they're, they're taking over and they're um, designing their own demands. Um, and, and all of a sudden, we're gonna have like a sort of new and exciting uh, political community, I think. Okay, so can you guys hear me? Okay, so we're gonna take a few questions. Um, so I have a question, I guess I can get it started and then we can filter the room and also Twitter to see if anyone has anything else they'd like to add. Um, so Mariana, you talked about how in Brazil, one of the tactics, the oppositional tactics that the students employed um, to kind of mitigate some of the harassment and intimidation that they were experiencing was to open the university even more. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we think about, um, you know, sometimes some of the mental uh, abuse as well as physical that students, you know, find themselves in when they do set forth to uh, organize themselves and the larger university, that, you know, they're confronted with violence. Um, so then, you know, the, the idea of a sanctuary space is necessary, but it's necessary before that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know, like, were there any ideas or conversations about, you know, employing like a type of sanctuary um, ideal for the universities or the schools in Brazil prior to the occupations? Not, um, let's see, can you hear me? This is better, right? Okay. Um, there was no such thing prior to the occupations, while the occupations were happening, uh, it became quite clear that um, an organization that would be in some kind of way, something similar to a sanctuary space would be necessary, uh, even for the organization that was happening. Only if, even if we consider only the student body and the faculty and administrators that were there are part of the overall university community. Uh, but once they 
they were already being very much harassed, even uh, by the police sometimes, uh, by authorities. And when they opened up the gates to, uh, to the external community, to the community leaders, to the neighborhood, um, then the fight became physical. Um, so you have, you have many pictures of the police just making uh, a line in front of the university just saying whoever is in is not getting out. Like if you insist on occupying, you're not getting out of the university's, uh, university ground anymore and no one's coming in anymore. So there was a shortage of food, of water for sometimes for students that were occupying and that's when the idea of a sanctuary place just was absolutely evident, the necessity of having uh, a, a safe place, that the university could not only be a safe place for those that were in it, but also for those, for a circulation of people, that people could just freely circulate from outside, inside, and vice versa. So yes, it was something that just, that happened during the occupations, but it wasn't something that was in the vocabulary of the occupations beforehand. Wow, that's really telling. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that leads me to my next question uh, for you, Ariana. What do you see, um, I mean, do you see this as something necessary to think about as far as like how do we de-escalate these situations? Um, because I think that there are times where, you know, it could get potentially violent, like what, what happened in Brazil and what happens elsewhere. Um, and also what happens here. I mean, the system that we're operating in is already violent. Um, but when it crosses that physical threshold, um, are we thinking about like strategies of de-escalation um, and also of self-defense that's not about like physical combat, but also like as a strategy to de-escalate situations? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, it's complicated. So, so far, um, you know, ICE hasn't come onto any college campuses, um, and most CUNYs have a policy of not allowing um, NYPD to kind of come on and, and remove students without going through the legal department. So there are some kind of processes in place to protect students from that, aggress that aggressive um, escalation. Um, I almost think of it as the opposite. I mean, I think that regardless of whether ICE or NYPD kind of starts coming into colleges um, freewheeling, um, the, they're, they're in the community, right? Um, and that's where they're taking students from. They're taking students from their homes and their jobs and, um, and sometimes even from public spaces. And so the kind of role of the emergency plan and rapid response is actually a kind of escalation tactic, if anything. Um, it's about, you know, uh, having a text ne network so that, you know, 50 people come onto the scene and can surround ICE cars. I mean, especially in the state of Arizona, um, they have like some really honed um, skills on this. We're behind the times in the Northeast. We've gotten like complacent, I would say. Um, so some of that is kind of um, being educated in that stuff. So like I see sort of what you're asking, but I think it, in, in this climate, um, if, you know, Homeland Security and ICE continues to kind of take their quote unquote shackles off, which is how they keep talking about it, right? Um, then, then there needs to be an escalation ra rather than a de-escalation. Interesting. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. So just to repeat the question, the gentleman asked, um, to what extent did the civil rights movement affect some of the current organizing that's happening here, um, referencing the Children's March? And then also, um, he had a question about leadership and is there any gender imbalance? Uh, to quickly an answer your question, at least in the case of Brazil, there is no, uh, um, oops, 
Uh, there's not such a direct influence from what goes on in the United States currently. Of course, there is a historical uh, influence, but not what's currently happening in the United States. There is a very uh, large influence of what happens in neighboring countries. So in student movements that happen in Argentina, Chile, so yeah, you can see the influence there. And the gender parity is terrible. <laughs> so you do not find many uh, literature that are made by women. So it's very hard to find a woman leader in student movements, unfortunately, still. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of the, you know, um, the dreamers and the sanctuary movement, um, there's so much influence from the civil rights movement. There's also even influence going back as far as, you know, the Civil War and kind of thinking about the, the Underground Railroad and the fugitive slaves. Um, that's definitely playing into the, like, kind of intellectual work that's going into thinking about sanctuary. And in terms of the civil rights movement, students, of course, like, still replicating things like campus sit-ins and things like that. Um, and, and, and also, um, I think a lot of you know, the, the dreamers say that they kind of were influenced by the LGBT movement in terms of like coming out of the closet, right? Um, but also now there's so much influence out of the Black Lives Matter movement into the kind of contemporary um, way that they do organizing and use online spaces and things like that. Um, and in terms of uh, gender, I would say it's interesting. Um, I would say there's a lot of young female leadership, um, a lot of the young Latinas, um, taking on leadership roles uh, in the sanctuary movement. That's definitely true at LaGuardia. Other questions? Okay, um, so I guess one other question I have. Um, Arnia, can you speak more about, you, you talked about organizing across scales, and I think I have an understanding of that um, as a fellow geographer, but I, I don't know if it's clear and apparent um, for everyone, so can you explain a little bit more of what that, what that entails? Sure. Um, so, okay, so for example, um, there's, uh, in terms of, okay, I'll, I'll talk about it at some different scales. So um, in terms of the PSC, um, the PSC sort of realized that uh, almost all of the CUNY campuses were kind of starting these <laughs> campus movements, and so they saw themselves as able to facilitate some cross-campus conversations. Some of that was already happening. Like we have a, um, a Google group that's just CUNY faculty kind of organizing these petitions and things at their different campuses. Um, but the PSC stepped in to try to, again, like create more cross-campus conversation so that we're not all like reinventing the wheel. So there's um, uh, things around creating curriculum, um, know your rights trainings, um, things like that. Um, also how to approach administrations. Like some campus presidents are, have been more willing to sit down with faculty and students than others. Um, uh, so ways to deal with it and strategize around those sorts of things. Um, in terms of like with like other college campuses nationally, again, it's like about sharing information, I would say. Um, I mean, it all started online, right? Like some petitions came out of um, some schools in Southern California, California like Pomona, um, and then they started just spreading around like these sort of Google Docs, um, spreading around through different um, networks. And I mean, that's where I, I, mine was just mostly cut and pasted from others. Um, and so I think a lot of them started like that. So th that's um, been a big part of it, yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? We can take one more question and then we'll move on to the break. Go ahead. So thank you for your question. Um, 
one of the I think that one of the most interesting aspects of the of the occupation run by students is the fact that in fact they built links of solidarity with many the, many unions. There is a student union, a national student union that uh, in Brazil already, and the national student union was not responsible for organizing the occupations. They just they developed out of their own. Uh, but the students started uh, linking, making links of solidarity with teachers' unions <coughs> and workers' unions. And in fact, one of the things that was most impressive about the occupations is that you would find on the signs themselves, not only um, there was a hashtag that became very famous that it was like, uh, don't destroy my school, or uh, education is not expenditure, it's an investment in the future, uh, and so on, but also you would see signs such as against the illegal occupation of native lands. And they started taking up uh, some pleas that were not at all connected to education in the first stance, but it, this was, yes, exactly, it was very interesting to, to observe. Yeah. Um I would say it's in the early phases, um, but for sure that's why I wanted to include that um, slide of the uh, drum messaging. Um, the Ice Free Queens and Ice Free NYC, um, the Hate Free Zone, um, the kind of broken windows, uh, anti-broken windows movement. There's a lot of different um, kind of already established like political organizations um, and political movements in New York City that the campus, the sanctuary campus movements are getting linked up to because they're a natural fit, right? Students, um, the kinds of students that um, go, certainly go to LaGuardia, and I think this is true of a lot of CUNY are, are you know, targeted all the time by broken windows. And so they may end up in deportation proceedings, not having to do anything with campus, but something like jumping a turnstile, right? So, um, so yeah, so I think that those, those uh, solidarities are, are in the beginning stages. One more question? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, there is an issue with the occupation because it's a form of enclosure. Mm -hmm. okay? And you're enclosed in a public university which somebody who doesn't agree with the same with your activism mm -hmm. they say, you know, what I want to say, I want to go to class and stuff like that. So how do you deal mm -hmm. with your own how to address that question? Mm -hmm. uh, and second, uh, in terms of uh, defining, let's say, federal government Okay, so I'll just repeat the question. The question was, how do we deal with um, the occupations as also like a sort of form of enclosure? Um, so how do we deal with that, that conflict that might emerge? And then what is the backup plan? Um, since we're talking mostly about public education, what's the backup plan um, if federal funding is cut? So thank you for your question again. Um, it is a very important question and actually the the occupations as a strategy, they, uh, they came about as a response to strike as a strategy, which uh, by main, it's usually deployed not only by uh, faculty, members of the faculty, but you have a lot of students strike as well. And uh, this criticism that it would be then a form of not only of enclosure, but just of freezing such an important part of the, the community life, which is the school, let's say, or the university, right? Just freeze all of their activities. Uh, instead of doing this, uh, then the students would occupy the schools or the universities and make them run and have them running with activities instead of simply striking. Um, and this was a way of responding to the criticism that a simple strike wouldn't need to work on as a whole. 
uh, and would just, I don't know, stop uh, activities in the university or in the school. And then they decided to occupy. And during the occupations, this is a, a, something that it's very, uh, there, there wasn't a one strand or one, um, only one way that it happened. It depends on each one of the, the institutions has its own history. But many universities didn't stop. The classes didn't stop. In other universities, the class did stop. So it's not completely homogeneous there what happened exactly. It depends from institution to institution. Um, there's two things I want to say about the federal funding question. So for people who don't know, um, the Trump administration and members of Congress have sort of thre already threatened sanctuary campuses with um, defunding. So the first thing is um, that to be real, we have long been in a, in a climate of austerity, right? There, and, and so it's sort of disingenuous to pretend like, oh, if we become sanctuary campuses, there all of a sudden is going to be defunding, when the truth is there's been a long push for defunding, right? We all know this. Um, whatever excuse they can give for that, they will give. <laughs> um, the, the second thing um, is that the, I read the language. You know, there already is a kind of bill in the works through um, in the House of Representatives. Um, you can read it online um, at the, you know, through the whatever.gov. Um, but in any case, you know, the language doesn't describe sanctuary as um, campuses that define themselves as sanctuary. It, des it describes campuses as sanctuary campuses that quote unquote harbor illegal aliens, okay? So whether or not LaGuardia or CUNY deems themselves a sanctuary university, by their definition, we are a sanctuary university. So it's like lean in or don't, you know? Um, so that's kind of my feeling about it. Um, I think you have much more, you're in a position of much more political power, right? Um, if you kind of claim the thing and define the thing and organize around the thing, then kind of live in fear of defunding. And almost every um, you know, lawyer that I have spoken to or, or heard speak on this issue says that there's also kind of um, Supreme Court precedent um, that you can't kind of defund one thing based on something else you don't like. Um, so there are, it also seems that there's protection against that. And as usual, it's probably just hot air. Thank you. So I think we're going to move on to the 10-minute uh, intermission right now. Um, you all can feel free to have coffee um, over to, well, my right, but maybe some of you all your left. Um, and we will reconvene in about 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with the second half of the event of Global Perspectives on the Fight for Higher Education. And so our first set in the second half of the event, um, we are going to have some of our colleagues from South Africa speak, uh, Zandi Ravity and Cleopatra Fuzani Ntumbu. Um, and they are both from the University of South Africa. Oh, she Sandy, can you hear us okay? Yes. Okay, you can feel free to start. Is it good afternoon that side? Yes. Yeah, it's 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 toward midnight to us. But anyway, good afternoon, everyone, and really thank you for having us. And we apologize for coming on this late and, you know, so sort of changing the program. We had difficulties with connecting. Um, can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, yes, my name is Zandi and I am a lecturer at the University of South Africa. I'm here with Cleopatra Fundani. She's actually not from UNISA or the same university mm -hmm. that I come from. She's actually from the University of Johannesburg. Um, I chose her to be part of this conversation because we try to work across universities and we come from the same community, so it made sense, you know, to bring someone who comes from that community, but from a different university. But also Cleo is, as you might have seen, 
Um, she's one of the student leaders um, in the Fees Must Fall movement, and she's also women, you know, a female, which is something quite important, but she'll, she'll tell you all about herself in a second. Um, but then I think for us, the, the, the point of departure really is, is um, the fact that most of, you know, students, most of the people, the general population in South Africa, um, are not aware of their history. You know, there are serious historical omissions, serious uh, historical silences when it comes to the question of education in South Africa. Of course, you would know that we went under a period of, you know, apartheid or what some other people call it, a special kind of colonialism whereby, you know, racism was institutionalized and actually legal. So when a people comes out of of that process, um, they obviously were not aware of the true history because everything that was about black people in South Africa and it, it, the rest of the world, you know, was hidden from the general population of South Africa. So when we came from the 1994 moment, you know, the moment where we were told that Duke, you are now free and South Africa belongs to all who live in it black and white, people started for the first time, I think, um, they started questioning and they started, you know, asking questions on various levels. And obviously in the education sector, the question that came was that, is this colonial um, curriculum sufficient for us, you know, South Africa as a liberated group? And I think that's where the fees must fall, roles must fall um, movement emerged from. It emerged from, you know, a group of young people who started to ask, you know, these, these basic questions, you know, if, if I'm at a particular institution, do I feel part of that institution? When I walk around campus, am I, you know, represented in the, in the, in the institution? When I'm in the classroom, am I treated as a human being? You know, am I, is my history reflected? in the curriculum? Am I being taught, you know, as a liberated thing? And of course, the answer was disappointingly no. And so it was not surprising, at least for, for most of us who have been following, you know, the history of South Africa in terms of, you know, what young people can do. Um, it was not surprising to have the, the, the roads must fall moment because for the first time, you would understand that, you know, the, the first group of students that went into UCT could not see the statue, you know, at least when they saw it, it did not offend them because that particular group, you would know, was dealing with issues of poverty. In other words, these were people who were, you know, experiencing whiteness for the first time and they were overwhelmed because most of them came from societies and communities that did not have, you know, white people. So I remember one, one friend of mine was telling me that, you know, um, she could not see the statue because what she saw was the amount of food that she was now allowed to have because she was at a university. And so with this group of students, Students, the students that actually called for the stage, um, for the statue of roads to be removed. These are the students that come from, you know, your Model C school, whereby they are, you know, in the same classroom with white kids. But then at that time, obviously, because of age, they are not necessarily thinking, you know, critically about making, um, about raising these serious questions. So being at university, you know, especially a space like UCT gave them that space. And that's where how we have um, the roads must fall movement. And then it also moved to, I think, a point whereby when South Africa gained its independence or so-called freedom, um, and it, it, the university again was behind. In fact, nobody questioned the university in terms of you know, the curriculum and what they teach. And most of the academics today still teach you know, colonial um, knowledge or colonial content. And you would understand that these are again are products of you know um, students who were trained you know under the same universities that did not teach you know true African history, and so for us it does not really surprise us that the students took to the street in the way they did, because you would remember again back in June 1976 where the high school students of Soweto, much younger than their varsity counterparts today, 
went out to demand, you know, that they be taught um, not in Afrikaans, which was then, you know, the language of, you know, um, the apartheid regime. But one thing that I think we miss when you read into um, June 16, 1976, as well as the current roles must fall, fees must fall, is that both group of students were not only asking for um, the doing away with Africans as a medium of instruction, they were, they were not also asking um, for fees to be scrapped. They're actually, you know, trying to make historical demands because they have come to a realization that, you know, even though we are told that we are free, um, 22 years of democracy has not, you know, um, liberated the majority of black people. Black parents cannot afford to send their children to university. Those who can afford to send their children to university, the children actually discover that the universities are actually, you know, against them. They are repelling them. And therefore, these are some of the things that that um, informed the roads must fall, trees must fall movement. Um, especially in South Africa. I think Leo can, can elaborate on her experience of, you know, his must forward, Rose must forward, and what this means, and then we can have a conversation after that. Thanks. So afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Leo Petra, and I'm from the University of Johannesburg, and which is essentially like a university um, that was merged um, between a historically Black universities, three historically black universities, and one um, African university that was predominantly white. Essentially, there was a white um, university, right? So, um, well, Rhodes Must Fall started off as Tuman Makwele, which was like um, who's a, who was a student at the University of Cape Town, throwing um, feces on a statue of Cecil Rhodes, right? Um, as a sign of saying that we are essentially, essentially um, tired of, of all the colonial symbols that surround us in our country and of course in our universities as well. So um, fees must fall then came right after that. But essentially what Holds Must Fall did was to open up a conversation around decolonization and what it means to um, decolonize South Africa in post in what we call post apartheid apartheid because we still believe that there are still um, oppressions that are still intent as as Susan has spoken historically about everything that South Africa has has gone through. He she essentially gave um like the historical context of 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 fees must fall and holes must fall. So from that and being cognizant of all that history um that we come from, then the uh, the university students then saw that Actually, we are not necessarily um, free, you know, as they, they as we should be. Uh, but then, um, and so that opened a lot of conversation around decolonization. That opened a lot of conversation about around our our country and what we now call the democratic state. And so, um, from Holds Must Fall, we moved to Fees Must Fall, right? So Holds Must Fall happens in March. And then fees must fall comes right after, um, right after, which was like around October. And essentially, we were saying that majority of the black um, students cannot necessarily afford going into these universities. Um, and that's essentially because, given the history that we come from, um, given the history that we we we, we come from, um, most of our parents cannot necessarily afford the fees. So it was not only about the fees, it was also about um, the system, um, the institutionalized um, racism and other forms of oppression that we faced within our universities. And so that called on a conversation on decolonization, it called on a conversation on actually reflecting on our country on the 23, 23 years of the so-called democracy. Right. So, to me, as um, a student and as a um, as a black woman who actually comes from what 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 is called a disadvantaged uh, background, um, Fismas Falls spoke to me directly, 
And that is the, re the reason why I felt the need to join in the movement. To join in the movement, um, fees must fall came in parallel with outsourcing must fall. And so that sort of like addressed the issues of um, surrounding, obviously, the fact that the people that work within our own universities um, are our parents. And as uh, people that work as, as cleaners and as, as, as gardeners and security guards. So those people are our parents and they were outsourced and we could not benefit from um, all the, the like the benefit the benefits that come with being a permanent employee within a university. So we then um, sort of integrated those struggles to say that we cannot afford fees because of these historical uh, this is this historical uh, background and our mothers are like also um, somehow excluded, right? Um, so we want to integrate all these these um, sort of struggles that we're facing as black people in our universities, as, as black students in our universities to question the status quo and to question the system the way it, 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 it is currently. And so a lot of things, of course, happened during um, Things Must Fall. We experienced a lot of um, um, Depression from the university and from the state. We experienced a lot of violence from the state and the universities, even in how the protests were handled. The post protests were handled. So um, we got arrested. Um, we got threatened. We played within our own universities. We got um, students being sexually harassed by bouncers and um, the so-called police uh, policemen that came in um, into our universities to stop the protests. Um, a lot of, a lot of. I mean, I I, I remember once I got followed um, to where I stay by the police because I was the so-called leader of FISMAS Foil, and and so. Um, and so, like the violence that we sort of like experienced in the in, in by the from the university and from the state was sort of like a depiction of how the apartheid system is still very much intact. Because in, in even in how like the 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 university and the state handled our protest is somewhat somehow similar to the way they handled um, the 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 protest during the apartheid era. Essentially, it's just this time they went uh, dead bodies, but then but then the way the violence was 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 was, was executed was very much the same way. Um, so. So, like, oh, given all that, of course, um, then that is still like a an open debate on on how do we how do we then get to how do we then get to uh, a point where we um, actually achieve this free decolonized education for for every single one of those students and black students who are coming in and black children who do not have hope of getting into the university because of fees or because of um, History, the historical ones that they have. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Eve Tuck. Um, Dr. Tuck is joining us from Canada right now. Um, just give us one moment to toggle through and have Dr. Tuck um, with us very shortly. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. It's, it's good to be with you. Um, I uh, am, I, I feel like I get to benefit by hearing the other papers first and thinking about connections between those papers and what I have, have plan to offer you today. Um, I'm talking to you from Toronto, from Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, and it's good to be talking with you, you who are in Lenni Lenape territory. Um, I know the room that you're in very well because that's where I, I, I did my PhD, my, all of my graduate studies at the CUNY Graduate Center. And I was really grateful when Allison extended the invitation to me. And my understanding is that, uh, that 
Allison was really interested in me bringing some of the, the writings that I've been doing about um, learning from Audra Simpson's work on ethnographic refusal and, and um, uh, uh, refusing research and typical research practices in the academy. And so I have appreciated hearing about um, Fees Must Fall, which is a movement that I have um, a great amount of respect for and have learned a lot from, and also from the sanctuary campuses movement um, and, and learning about um, other work that's happening in other places in order to um, secure access to the university. Um, what my paper offers in terms of thinking about global fights for public education has to do with um, the research projects and the research um, goals which are uh, buried into what we think of as graduate education. So for many scholars, working inside universities represents an opportunity to leverage universities on behalf of communities. And other scholars use ways to reframe university-based labor with regard to promoting social justice. Um, so this paper is um, part of a longer or perhaps never concluding conversation about the futures that the academy can really entertain. Um, the settler colonial roots of the academy have been thoroughly documented and it's not hard to guess at its settler colonial futures. Um, so there are parts of higher education, public higher education, which are so, which continue to be so invested in settler colonialism that they may not be able to be rescued. And I offer this as a truism into this conversation. It's not necessarily something that I'm gonna argue in this, in this presentation. Um, and I, in, in my broader work, I think through the theories of change at work in academic research and um, those theories of change which connect, can connect most meaningfully uh, to decolonization projects undertaken by indigenous communities. So um, this work I've, I've framed in other presentations as, as thinking about um, how we can bite the university that feeds us. And um, I, I, in 2010, I made this decision that anytime anybody would ever ask me to teach or write about neoliberalism, that I would talk about settler colonialism instead. Um, so settler colonialism is different than other colonial formations, which focus on the extractions of labor and resources. Often in addition to these extractions, settler colonialism is ultimately about the pursuit of land for settlement. Settler colonialism requires the destruction of indigenous communities in order to clear land for settlement through genocide and assimilation and appropriation and state violence, indigenous presence is erased. Settler colonial nation states are founded on indigenous erasure, both because indigenous peoples have moral and often legal claims to land, but also because indigeneity is collective. Indigenous collectivity is the context for the hyper-focus on the individual and the distaste for collectivity that are so typical of neoliberal and white settler societies. Um, settler colonialism is relentless, but it's never fully successful because of what Gerald Bisner has called indigenous survivance. Indigenous communities have always resisted and theorized dispossession. In the United States and other slave estates using uh, Hortense Spiller's term, the remaking of land into property has been accompanied by the remaking of African persons into property, into chattel. And this can be connected to neoliberalism's ideation of the flexible landless workforce. The remaking of indigenous land and black, pe uh, black people into property is necessary for white settlement onto other people's land. Um, 
Monique Gachard and I have synthesized several research pro uh, recent projects in which scholars have traced the histories of their academic disciplines, such as anthropology, psychology, bioethics, and education, um, and the work of these disciplines on behalf of the false logics of emergent settler colonial nation states. And so that's work that I did with Monique Gachard in 2013. And um, uh, the questions that I have been asking, having learned about the settler colonial roots of many academic disciplines have to do with weather research. So is research really the intervention that is needed? Is research going to make um, a social problem better or worse? Is research going to do what we think that it will do? If we need it, need it to do something specific, is it still research? Or um, do we need research or do we need organizing? Um, I've also been asking questions about wither research. So why are these the questions that we need to ask in this particular place? What questions have been asked before and how satisfying were the answers? What is the history of inquiry in this place? What research crimes have been done here and what forms of knowing have been dismissed? What questions need to be asked here even if they can't be answered through research? Um, the context of these questions is one in which stories of pain are highly valued in social science research. That is, the research stories which are considered most compelling, considered to be most authentic in social science research, are stories of pain and humiliation. Reporting on that pain with detailed qualitative data and in people's real voices is supposed to yield needed material or political resources. This is the prominent but unreliable theory of change in the academy. Of course, settler colonialism, other colonial configurations, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and the pursuit of wealth by some at the expense of others has indeed caused pain in the lives of real people, and this deserves scrutiny and exposure. It's important that we put settler state violence under scrutiny. Um, but um, in, in writing that I'm drawing from here that I've done with Wayne Yang in 2014, Wayne and I presented three axioms of social science research that ground our analysis for the need for refusal to inquiry as invasion. Those axioms are, one, the subaltern can speak, but is only invited to speak our pain. So drawing, from Bell Hooks 1990 observation that the Academy fetishizes stories of the violated, we note that what passes for subaltern voice in research is a commodities market for pain narratives. As Hooks says, there's no need to hear your voice. Only tell me about your pain. I want to know your story. The second axiom is that there are some forms of knowledge that the academy doesn't deserve. This axiom is the crux of refusal. The university is not universal. Rather, it is a colonial collector of knowledge as another form of territory. There are stories and experiences that already have their own place and placing them into the academy is, is removal, not respect. The third axiom is that research may not be the intervention that is needed. This axiom challenges the latent theory of change that research, more academic knowing, will somehow innately contribute to the improvement of tribal communities, other communities, youth, and schools. The regulatory ethical frames that now dominate the conversation about ethics in academe are only a recent provision, and they cannot do enough to ensure that social science is deeply ethical, meaningful, or useful for the individual or community being researched. The stories that are considered most compelling, 
considered most authentic in social science research are stories of pain and humiliation. In Audre Simpson's work on ethnographic refusal, which this entire discussion of refusal has, is indebted to and learns from, um, refusal is not just a no, but it is a type of investigation into quote, what you need to know and what I refuse to write in. Simpson asks the following questions on her own ethnographic work with members of Conowick Nation, her own nation. Can I do this and still come home? What am I revealing here and why? Where will this get us? Who benefits from this and why? These questions force researchers to contend with the strategies of producing legitimated knowledge based on the colonialization of knowledge. In Mohawk Interruptus, Simpson's 2014 book, Simpson writes that the calculus of what you need to know and what I refuse to write is a needed calculus, not because of the centrality of esoteric and sacred indigenous knowledge, but because of a quote, deep context of dispossession, of containment, of a skewed authoritative axis and ongoing structure of both settler colonialism and its disavowal. Um, and this is from page 105 in Simpson's 2014 book. A few lines later, Simpson writes, my notion of refusal articulates a mode of sovereign authority over the presentation of ethnographic data and so does not present everything. Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars of Native education have queried the dangers of appropriation of Native knowledge by mainstream research and pedagogical institutions. <clears throat> Lomo Wema and McCarthy describe the safety zone as ways in which indigenous knowledge are included into even overtly anti-native spaces, such as boarding schools designed to assimilate indigenous children. Indigenous knowledge is made harmless to settler colonial pedagogies by relegating it to the safety zone of the margins. Troy Richardson extends this analysis by discussing inclusion as enclosure, the encircling of indigenous education as part of a well-intentioned multiculturalist agenda. And this is where I see some important connections to what is being fought for in Fees Must Fall. Such, ge such gestures, he contends, reduce the indigenous curriculum to a supplement to a, a standard curriculum. Said another way, the academy as an apparatus of settler colonial knowledge already domesticates, denies, and dominates other forms of knowledge. The academy too refuses. The academy sets limits, but it disguises itself as limitless. Practices of refusal provide ways to negotiate how we as social science researchers can learn from the experiences of our peoples and from other dispossessed peoples, often painful, but also wise, full of desire and dissent without serving up pain stories on a silver platter for the settler colonial academy, which hungers so ravenously for them. Analytic practices of refusal involve an active resistance to the draw against trading in pain and humiliation and supply a rationale for resisting the settler colonial gaze, which wants those stories. Refusal can comprise a resistance to making someone or something the subject of our research. Refusal is a form of objectless analysis, an analytic practice with nothing and no one to code. Analytic practices of refusal can help researchers and the people who prepare researchers to avoid building our careers on the pain of others. Questions of settler colonial projects which have driven academic knowledge production are rarely part of graduate training. Who gets to know? Who gets known? 
Where is knowledge kept and where is knowledge legitimated? What knowledge is desirable and who profits? Who loses or gives something away? Who is coerced, empowered, or appointed to give away knowledge? In a sense, these are not open-ended questions, but ones that have already been answered for us. The academic practices that govern research, human subjects protocols and publishing, already territorialize knowledge as property and researchers as claims takers. Academic practices decide which stories are civilized, which are academic, are intellectual property, and what stories are terra nullius, are natural and wild, and thus claimable under the doctrine of discovery. Human subjects protocols establish that individuals must be protected, but not communities. Individuals are empowered to give away the community stories. Individuals may be compensated, but only lightly, only appropriately, with a small fee, a gift certificate to a university bookstore, a thank you note, a free meal, or a string of beads. In research methods across the North American continent, the message, uh, excuse me, research methods courses across North America, the messages that students receive is to study something anything to learn how to do research. But some objects of study are sexier, are more fetish, are thirsted after to garner an A or yield a publication. If you're going to do research, you had better find something worth saying and pain and humiliation are worth saying. Indigenous researchers, researchers of color and queer researchers in academe are frequently pressured to mine their families or communities and personal stories in order to recast these stories as academic data. The archive on pain just grows and grows. Novice researchers are explicitly and tacitly encouraged to go for low hanging fruit, interview your neighbors, your grandmother, but not everybody's grandmother promises to be interesting. Bring in personal artifacts and family heirlooms and stories, private moments and hawk them. Ironically, these same novice researchers may be caught in a choice between studying their own communities or waiting for somebody else to study their own communities, themselves even becoming informants in somebody else's study. When we learn something from our data that may make a contribution to a field, we call that something a claim. To claim something is to mark it as new and as newly mine. Claim has meant to call, to name, to describe. As a piece of land allotted and taken. Claiming is an act of possessing, of making property, of enclosure. Colonizers traveled on boats and horses to claim new lands of old crowns. Researchers make claims for a living. Claiming is public and personal. The work of, of doing research is the alchemy of becoming claims. And Wayne Yang and I have used this turn of phrase, becoming claims, to signal, of course, Deleuze's Liz, De conceptualizations of becoming, but also the production and the aesthetics of claims within settler colonialism. What others call the raw data, the things we heard on purpose or accidentally, the documents we glimpsed while flipping towards something else, the scent of a story that eked out of the cracks of an encounter, our notes. All of this mingles and mashes together to become claims. One minute. Many of these becoming claims come out of the lived lives of real people that we have met along the way. Their stories, their worries and desires, and their sense of the way that the world works. Refusal is not a code word for critical research or for socially engaged or culturally sensitive research. Refusal is not the reflexive caveat, the hand wringing, 
before proceeding as usual. The goal of research is not for objects to become subjects in the academy, but to object to the very processes of objectification and subjection, to the making of possessors and possessions, and the making of claims. Thank you, Eve. What a great discussion. Okay, we're gonna move on to our last speaker, last but certainly not least, Z Dempster from the Graduate Center at CUNY. Okay, I write much, so therefore I speak swiftly. <clears throat> Stand at the edge of Inwood Park at the northern tip of Manhattan, face the Hudson River and look straight ahead. What you will find staring back at the island are the Palisades. The steep cliffs that comprise the Palisades are about 20 miles long and, begin to, and began to build about 200 million years ago due to the Hudson River's slow progression from its river source, which was at a different elevation than its basin that's causing the creation of this rock formation. This natural phenomenon is a geologic time scale that has recorded the patches of time by its forms and depths, allowing us to measure time by examining its measures. I choose to speak about the Palisades because they are a result of the natural forces working in conjunction with time and the slow movement of the Earth, meticulous and exacting work that takes generations to produce over time highlighting how minuscule elements of being work together to create great wonders. Easily taken for granted because their work is not seen by one generation, it is work that takes ages to produce over long periods of time. This is labor, labor in its truest form, unencumbered by rationale and reason. In theory, human beings should operate within natural laws, not unlike how the Palisades were created but we are meaning-making machines. We tend to intellectualize and sensationalize all aspects of our lives to the point of alienating our everyday actions from nature itself. In the case of labor, we would benefit from remembering that all we do today should stand to benefit and serve the generations that follow. This is not always the case because we get caught up with throwing all our resources to immediate concerns. We tend to be reactionary. My commentary is primarily based on experience and common knowledge and does not include findings based on empirical research. Correlating these ideas into a workable theory is a new endeavor for me as I am at the beginning of exploring these relationships. I will attempt to purposefully refrain from tagging or naming ideas and practices to certain political ideologies in an attempt to free the concepts from judgments and predispositions. And if I may borrow from a traditional principle, the way I see labor as being its most effective is to keep to the idea that all parts work to create the whole. This is the basis of a Christian theology, but this guiding principle is found throughout the world in numerous cultures. When speaking of labor, activism, and higher education, I will borrow from this traditional principle. Labor, activism, and higher education have each become part of a system that has formed over the years to create a balance in how people are put to work, and how the workforce is sustained, and how the workforce is sustained over long periods of time. In relation to labor, we can say that there are no useless parts, the parts being each individual laborer. This, is not, this does not mean that every person is equal in ability or that every person is qualified and must receive work. We also cannot assume a 100% employable workforce. That is unrealistic, but there is an argument that by using the parts work to sustain the whole as a guiding principle, employing the greatest amount of people possible at a given time can be actualized while lessening volatility. I believe that this notion is extremely useful in creating balance and guiding decision making when it comes to making labor effective. There is a tendency to extract the natural part of man's movement and being from labor. Bodies wear and tear, age and disable. There ought to be an accounting for this as a regular practice in commerce, as well as preservation of bodies to sustain and further productivity while alleviating excessive pain and suffering in old age. This should not be presented as a burden to business as it only helps in the furtherance of profit and financial gain. Well-sustained, healthy bodies can only aid in production. Unions being the primary, primary activists commonly fight for physical and mental health benefits for workers. Now somewhere in here I should import some examination for and against Marxist theory 
uh, Webb Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington, or the film Normal Way, which is a dramatization of union activist Crystal Lee Sutton. And I may do so at another time, but not today. For now, I will say that activism grows from the need to realign to what is intended in nature. We work to sustain our livelihoods and become activists when we feel exploited through the use of our labor. Our labor is not separate from ourselves. Therefore, labor becomes part of a human rights issue. The idea that it is a burden to be responsible for all of the parts, again, human labor being the essential part, that some in labor are disposable and can be disregarded without notice or concern simply does not work. And I do use an example of um, the New Deal by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had a choice at the time to leave um, millions of people in despair or to rebalance society with government-sponsored protections. So the activist is an agent for change to reestablish balance, to restore balance to the workforce. As an example of activism through unions in history, I will use the Pullman Porters. Um, and I will admit that I pulled most of this from Wikipedia. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Cars Porters Union was formed in 1925 and was the first all-black union. A. Philip Randolph was their chosen leader. At that time, former slaves were sought out and hired to work on the railroads as porters on sleeping cars. Formation of the union was instrumental in the advancement of the civil rights movement. And until the 1960s, Pullman porters were exclusively black and have been widely credited for contributing to the development of the black middle class, classes in America. I bring, this in, I bring in this example to add notice to the importance of union activism in increasing the standard of living, which may not be achieved in any other way. My past activi activism in involved going to Albany to protest, the rent to protest the threat to rent stabilized apartments. Stability in housing is essential to growth and development. It contributes to security, mental health, finances, and obtaining an education. I had also actively campaigned for the first time for then presidential candidate Barack Obama in 2008, and it was out of a sense of making history and his message of hope and change that motivated me to get involved. I became a union member upon my employment at CUNY, but became an active or more of an activist about three years ago, and I was fortunate to have um, Andrea Vasquez as a mentor. There was a combination of factors that led to, to my becoming active in the PSC. The PSC is the Professional Staff Congress, which is a union that represents the workers um, of CUNY. Uh, the rising cost of real estate in New York City, including the transformation of Harlem and Brooklyn, juxtaposed to stagnant incomes. Uh, I realized that New York City has, had changed and was changing, and it is changing every day. And I found that things that I grew up with, stable housing, free quality public education, we're now in danger of becoming extinct. Um, and then I also looked at uh, corporate mergers and corporate business and mass layoffs. And I thought, how can this be happening after they receive generous tax breaks? And I'm sure we've all thought about this. And then looking at how workers were rehired with lower salaries um, as the cost of living continues to rise. And I myself had questions about how could a family of four, in New York City especially, be considered living in poverty, poverty with a yearly income of $33,000 a year? This is an old standard from the 1960s. And I thought, a family of four in New York City can be considered working class and working poor with a $100,000 a year income. Um, so these are the things that I was living with every day, and I'm thinking, how can I sit here and let this be happening and not get involved in some way? So we PSC members were working without a contract for five or six years, and I knew that what they would do, the management would say to us, okay, we'll give you retroactive uh, five years of 0% raises and then 1% raise for this year and next year. And I knew that if we did not do something to pressure the management in large numbers, that they would get away with this. So this is what spurred me to start getting involved, especially in the last few years. Um, I believe that business, the business world is necessary but not exceptional and not out of the realm of nature. Uh, supply side economics does not work. It did not fulfill its promise. Wealth on its own does not automatically spur investment in human capital. There is no natural tendency for business owners to reinvest even with government incentivized, incentivized motivators including tax breaks. If you want to invest in business, you will, and if you don't, you will not. You will take your profits and that's what you will do, use it. 
This is a global situation where there are growing concerns about temporary workers, high unemployment, and underemployment. People are putting off marriage, starting families, buying homes, and suffering psychologically, which dumps human growth and development along with innovation and productivity. It can become an endless cycle. Uh, corporations have moved to developing nations without union or government protections for labor, and they can exploit labor laborers by paying them pennies per day well below the cost of living and ignoring the possibility of future development of these employees. What I have found at the PSC, and I will move this to include unions in general, is a chance to work in solidarity with fellow laborers, faculty, and students to protect our own interests and to secure and advance our future and the future of other generations. Going back to my original statement that parts work together for the whole, union activism allows the individual, who in this case is the part, to force allegiances with other individuals such that, such that they are moved to improve the labor, and in this, case, labor, in this case, the labor force as a whole. Union activism is forcing the issue of the rights of labor. Without activism and without union activism, we are at the risk of becoming indentured. We could return to a feudal system, uh, subject to the whims of an overlord. And that may sound like colorful language, but um, not. The the feudal system was the labor system in place for thousands of years, and they still exist. Um, so what I will say is, we cannot rest on our laurels. There are no quiet times. Um, there can be no rest because there is a constant power struggle. One force or being is always looking to dominate another. The counterbalance to this is parity. Parity is, is a camouflage butterfly. Parity is an island of indigenous inhabitants surrounded by shark-infested waters. Parity weakens the authority of the adversary. Parity levels the playing field. What higher education does is give parity to those who might, otherwise, who might otherwise be marginalized against those to the man or born, or simply put, the privileged few. In conclusion, I will say, um, I am suspect of the attempts to treat higher education as a mystery, as if uh, management or as if government has stumbled onto this vast experiment called public education and are perplexed as to why we are spending morning, money on it after their own grandparents and parents use public education to advance themselves, build wealth, and then send their grandchildren and children to Ivy League schools. Now they want to destroy that bridge. This is how, uh, now they want to destroy that bridge, but we know public ed education works because they used it to get where they are and to move themselves ahead. So um, my la in conclusion, those who, should, those who should know better are treating the demands of the unions, uh, no tuition hikes, no divestment from public education as a strange request from people who cannot keep up with changes in society. So these are my thoughts on labor education and higher education. They are a natural part of our existence and how their interconnectedness is integral to sustaining our society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we all have a lot to chew on. Are there any questions from the audience, from online, on Twitter? Okay, I have a question then if no one else does, but I'm sure you guys didn't just come to hear me speak, but I will start off and ask a question. Um, so, Zandi and Cleo, uh, Eve talked about how uh, Settlement and the clearing of land or the clearing of land kind of makes a way for a settlement um, I'm wondering is there any place within the fallis movement that the question of land um, indigenous land is coming into question Were you all able to hear that? <laughs> Okay, I'll repeat the question. What is that sound? Hi, there's, there's a piercing sound. There's a piercing, okay. Can you repeat the question again? Yes, for sure. Um, I was saying that in Eve's presentation, she talked about how the clearing of land 
um, paves the way for settlement. Um, and since we're talking about decolonization, I wanted to know um, how does land come up or does it come up within the Fallis movement in Azania, which many of us know as South Africa? Yeah. Do we answer now? Or there goes that sound again. trouble we're running into is uh, because the sound system in here is so far from uh, the, the input microphone. So we ha when we mute our side, um, I think it's, it's better for you all. You don't hear that, that feedback. Um, but when we're listening to you, when we turn that back on, we're getting the feedback again. Um, we'll stop talking on our side and unmute and let you speak, and hopefully it'll be, it'll be better. We'll give this a try. It's actually it's it's actually better now, but it seems as soon as we speak, it it picks up. But let me try let me try just answer the question. Um, as we said in the very beginning, that the fees must fall, rules must fall um, struggle is actually a, a historical question. The demands that the students are making are historical demands, demands that were not addressed um, when South Africa gained its, its freedom. And one of um, these demands, at least fundamentally, is the land question, because you cannot um, consider yourself um, free as a dispossessed being if you have not dealt with the question of your dispossession. In other words, you cannot leave the land question out of you know the demand for fees because much as the students don't have um, money to pay, it's 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 it speaks to the economic factor that or rather the role that the disposition of land pay, plays because if it was addressed as it should have been um, instead of being negotiated away in 1994 we wouldn't have you know parents struggling to pay fees today in fact would have done um, away with you know some of the poverty that students are facing so I think the land question has been very very central um, in the in the fees must fall movement and also because South Africa is a settler um, colonial country so the fees must fall movement calls into question that arrangement um, in, in, in its in its entirety the students are saying we will not just um, demand access to education but we want an education that reflects who we are in other words the content um, and the practice of education must reflect you know the fact that South Africa is a liberated nation the fact that you know blacks in South Africa have been um, given access to you know rights and freedoms but because the land has not been addressed of course students will always feel that you know universities are not enough as spaces of self-actualization um, and so forth maybe Claire wants to expand on that yeah but um i think you you actually covered covered almost everything now. It's okay. Okay. so i think that was enough. Okay. are there other questions from the audience Um, as a, a follow-up to you know, the, the last response, um, if public education is supposed to tailor like knowledge according to the, the desires of a specific community, I'm not saying in many, many ways for color or for minority, then wouldn't that create kind of like a parochialism, which is something that we shouldn't, um, you know, if we look for more integration, more like more understanding, should we do that to to priorities for not? And, and also in terms of um, integrating, if for example the, the wealth part is the state dominated by whites, would you how are you gonna cover uh, uh, the into that economic system and basically Do you think you could paraphrase that? I'm not sure they could hear. Were you able to hear that? Um, 
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, um, so the gentleman asked, um, basically, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm misunderstanding your question, um, but I guess his question was more so about um, the distribution of resources and wealth, um, and how can we infiltrate um, that hoarding of wealth uh, through, without going through these, uh, I guess, what would you say, like? The standard, let's say, system that created it. The standard like system that creates that. Outside of that system, how do you go within to allow for distribution of this market? Because, because I understood that she was asking for more, like, a community-centered uh, content for the curriculum for education. And Sounds fine, but at the same time, you may isolate yourself from, from, from that other outside system which creates and hoards and uh, monopolizes both. Okay. Um, so I guess the question more so is how do you infiltrate the system or, um, you know, those people, the elites who are holding and hoarding all the wealth? Um, when I guess the goal is to um, have a community-based form of education, like how can you reconcile the two? Okay, um, that's actually a very beautiful question. Um, the demand for decolonization, I think first and foremost, um, forces both students and academics to imagine a different society, right? So as academics in, in universities, we are not just there um, to make sure that the curriculum is changed, but we are also extending ourselves to communities outside the university so that we firstly collapse the divide between the ivory tower and the community and to also allow for the community to, to access the university and for knowledge is to move between these two spaces. So we are in a way trying to build, you know, these communities. We are not waiting for um, decolonization to unfold fully. In fact, I would say that we are actually building communities outside, you know, the current system because we are aware that firstly, when it comes to small things such as funding, Right. We are aware that the system will not fund us. You know, anyone who's talking about the decolonization um, agenda, be it inside or outside the university, faces um, the challenge of being, you know, excluded from funding and from being just, you know, repressed you know, by the powers that be. So there is that um, very, very strong sense of building communities outside the university. Um, for example, I belong to a community-based um, organization known as the Black House Collective. It is based in Soweto. And what we do is when the universities were expelling students and, you know, kicking them out, we actually took the students and not only did we give them accommodation, but we also um, gave them an opportunity to share whatever knowledge they know or they have with, you know, younger students in communities. Um, that in a way validates the work that they do. It says, look, what you have been excluded for is important, not just for you, but for future generations to come. So we are continually um, engaged in the process of, you know, creating and recreating ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the powers that um, oppress us. And can I add on yes, sure, please. Um, also, to add on that, I think that's one lesson that we took from um, the two years, the, police, the two years of Fees Must Fall, that it's very important that we actually consolidate our struggles with the, uh, with the ones of uh, the communities that we essentially come from, because uh, we cannot necessarily um, isolate the two, right? So, one thing also that we actually did was to consolidate. Um, the student struggle with the Marikana struggle. So um, there was Marikana massacre that happened here in South Africa in 2012. And what happened last year is that we, um, as the student activists and the police, we went to uh, the Marikana community to engage with the people of Marikana. And that was a complete different sort of like uh, ball game altogether as compared to Fees Was Four. And I think that um, helped us in is sort of like trying to say, in, in saying that it's actually very important for us to consolidate our struggles with, with, with the community struggles, especially if we are going to be uh, talking about decolonization, because essentially we do not necessarily want to decolonize institutions, but we want to decolonize the whole society. And how do we even talk about um, 
de uh, decolonizing institution in a colonized society. So um, one thing that we actually took out from, from, from the two years of Phase Must Fall was that we need to um, come up with a way to engage the, the, the communities in what, what we mean when we speak about decolonization, come up with a language, because also language is, is a barrier, because in, in universities we use English, but then the people outside of our, uh, outside of our universities in our society, um, English is not necessarily their primary language. So that's one thing that we actually said and said, we need to come up with um, a way in which we can engage our communities um, to make a, make them understand the concept of decolonization and what we mean when we use we calling for decolon for a decolonized society and just um, trying to make them understand um, the system at large. So um, that's one way that we have sort of like identified to say that we need to consolidate ourselves with the community. We need to go out out more outside of our universities. So yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, I have a question. I think it's mostly for Dr. Tak, but maybe someone here with the rest of it. So one is two parts. One of the first part is that a, uh, it sounds like she doesn't want to open the conversation with marginalized, disenfranchised groups into qualitative data. So that is a question. I think she said that. And the second part is if, a, if the pain stories, the pain narratives, lead to transformational experiences, and activism, educators, and healers. So what's wrong with telling the pain story? It shows that that's only part A of the story. Part B is what people do with the pain. And particularly if it generates transformational leadership. So that was my question for Dr. Tuck and anybody here who might address that. Um, Eve, can you hear me? She's unmuting. Give me one more second. Yeah. Okay. Eve, could you hear that question? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> okay. Um, so the gentleman asked, um, I guess his question was more centered around if the pain, it's more of a question of what people do with pain stories. Um, so he wanted to know your thoughts on that. Um, and did you? The first part is it, it sounded like she didn't want us to capture the voice of marginalized people. Oh, and he's saying that it that also sounds sound like. It sounds and like the second is what happens if pain narratives actually are transformative stories. The pain is only the initiative to transformation and activism. Okay. Um, the other question was um, if we don't address the stories of pain, does that exclude marginalized uh, stories and narratives and perspectives? Um, and it's more, I guess, for him, he's asking is it more of a question as to how we address the pain within the institution? <laughs> I think I have never heard the Academy promise to do anything to address people's pain. I don't think that I've ever heard the Academy say that it has goals towards social justice. I don't think I've ever heard a university say that it wants to work to reduce the experiences of pain or humiliation for people who have been dispossessed. And so I don't know why we have that expectation for research that it is a thing that's good at <clears throat> reducing pain when there's has never been that promise that it, it sets about to do that. Um, I think that what I am trying to ask about is what is the, what is the theory of change that we want to engage? Like what, how do we think that we can change the experience of pain or experience of humiliation um, usually in the face of state violence? And what role does research have in that change? And then what role does academic research have in that change? Um, I think that the only way that 
indigenous people, people of color, queer people, trans people show up in the academy is through our pain stories. And when the academy has not made any overt or even subtle promise towards commitment to our communities, I don't, I don't expect it. I don't expect the circulation of those pain stories to, to do much except for ex expand the archive that the academy has reached for. <laughs> So that does not mean that I think that pain stories don't do so much in our relationships and in our communities and in our families and in our what, what I talk about with my children and what I talk about with my friends. I just don't know that the Academy deserves those stories without making some commitments about what it's going to continue to do with those stories. Because so far what the Academy does with, with those stories is it uses those as evidence for our continued dispossession. It's so weird to talk in this way because I can't hear anybody's reactions. And, but um, I hope that that's a satisfying response. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I know that we're out of time for today. Um, I just would like everyone to join me in thanking all of our panelists and our moderator, Allison Guess. One more time, please. There have been so many important topics that have come up today, and I know that there's a lot more to say um, and a lot more questions that we all have and many more things to discuss. Um, so a few more ways that you can continue the discussion. Um, getting started right now, actually, there's a Twitter chat um, at the same hashtag that we've been using, Fight for EDU, that's being run by graduate students who are part of the Haystack Scholars Program. Um, they will be addressing um, continued questions and discussion based on the panelists' presentations and based on questions that, um, that they have come up with themselves as well. So you're welcome to participate in that from now until 5 p.m. Um, there's also a film screening that uh, will happen here in this room tomorrow from 6 to 9 p.m., sponsored by the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, who also co-sponsored today's event. Um, the film Carré Rouge sur Fond Noir, or Red Square on the Blackboard, is about the 2012 Quebec student strikes that mobilized 400,000 students to protest and defeat a 78% tuition hike in the province. Um, the same organization, the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, will also host a two-day event May 5th and 6th called Consciousness and Revolution, Educating for Change in the Era of Authoritarian Politics. We thought that might be of interest to people here. Um, and I should say, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Katina Rogers. I'm the Director of Administration and Programs for the Futures Initiative. Um, we have one more public program coming up this semester. It's our spring symposium that will cap off the University Worth Fighting For series that we've been running um, all of this year and all of last year as well, where we've tried to address questions that are important to um, equity within the academy and how to build the kind of university that we all want to support. Um, that will take place, our symposium will take place on April 3rd. It'll be a full day event. There'll be more information about that coming soon. Um, oh, and I left my copy over on my chair, but we're also proud to announce, announce the launch of a new book called Structuring Equality. Um, this is a completely student written, student edited, student designed book that we're immensely proud of. Um, the digital version is available for free at haystack.org um, and a print version will be available soon at a very low cost um, on Amazon. So thank you all again for coming. We hope to see you on April 3rd, if not before. Thank you again to our panelists and to Allison. <laughs>